Welcome to this lecture in the MOOC Mental Borders, Physical Borders and the Shaping of Modern European Identity and Citizenship. I am Regine Paul. I'm an associate professor and political scientist here at UEBA. And this lecture addresses the notion of border head on by asking what's the border anyway? It will introduce to you classic border concepts in political theory and problematize them from a relational perspective. No worries, I'll explain what relational means in a second. But let us start with a recent anecdote from European migration and mobility governance. In May 2020, the German government took the decision to charter flights for Romanian and Bulgarian workers to pick asparagus. The government then lifted the very strict mobility restrictions in the corona pandemic with a triple win argument. German producers would save the highly valuable harvest and avoid bankruptcy. German consumers would be able to eat their favorite late spring dish. And Eastern European workers would keep access to comparatively well-paid jobs. Now, it is moments of crisis like that where government choices become visible as political. This episode of state-granted mobility in the middle of a global halt on mobility, in the middle of a restriction on, um, on borders and border closures, uh, shows us that uh, the decisions to open borders, to erect borders, are political. And we want to talk a little bit more about uh, this notion of borders and what they actually do in that lecture. Now, before I explain to you two different concepts of borders, I invite you to reflect by yourself. What is a border in your mind and what does it do? So you're invited now to scan the QR code that you see on the screen uh, and or connect to the web link in your browser that I also give there. And you'll be connected to an Everpad. Some of you might have used that before, where you can go um, and answer some questions anonymously. And you can go back to this pad after our lecture and compare your thoughts that you have now before I um, present to you some more concepts of borders. You can compare them with your own thoughts and with insights um, from uh, your fellow students. So feel free to pause now in this lecture and answer the reflection question. Now, in classic political theory, entry and residence control count as pivotal state activities. As Weiner argued already in the 90s, governments want to be able to choose which people to admit, how many, for what purposes and for how long. They don't want these decisions to be made by employers, other governments or would-be migrants. Now, uh, the German sociologist um, Max Weber, still widely used definition of state, creates an intrinsic link between sovereignty, state sovereignty, and territoriality. This emphasizes the importance of physical borders to the terrain in which any state legitimacy legitimately rules. And the close intersection of the, the idea of territory and nation in the nation state means that any physical demarcation of state also requires a demarcation of the population over which that state can legitimately re rule. Now, from this perspective, borders are a precondition for external sovereignty. Um, and that is defined by um, political um, scientist Krasner as the political organization based on the exclusion of external actors from authority structures within a given territory. So that is a, the idea of external sovereignty and borders are very central to that. But it's also important from a perspective on internal sovereignty, whereas states have engaged in attempts to and I quote Torpy, monopolize the capacity to authorize the movement of persons. Mainly, that is done mainly through issuing passports to people, through defining the conditions for access to citizenship, but also the issuing of visas to people who don't have citizenship. However, the organizing principles and functions of modern state, when we understand them in that classic way, are in constant conflict with the much older phenomenon of human migration. 
This tension has informed the notion of migration crisis among especially richer OECD countries, at least since the 1990s, but also earlier than that. And in line with such crisis perceptions, migration policy and border control uh, count as failures wherever they can't prevent unauthorized, unauthorized movements and residents. So this is the starting assumption in a lot of classic political theory about what borders do and why migration is a problem for borders. Now, in um, more recent um, border studies, this kind of thinking is described as an absolutist understanding of the border. And I draw on the work of Prem Kumar Rajaram here, and you'll find a reference to his work in my introductory text for this lecture. Um, now, the absolutist understanding of borders involves uh, three different perspectives on space, regulation and um, selectivity. Uh, it assumes that borders are experienced mainly in a territorial manner, in a concrete manner at the physical border. Think of biometric controls at airports or the Mexican or Israeli walls. They involve a regulatory focus on entry and exit. Um, and the enforcement of these rights. And they involve uh, a focus on a rather unidimensional understanding of selectivity. So you're either in or out from that perspective. You're either a legal, uh, you either have a legal status or a so-called illegal or unauthorized status. Now, that absolutist understanding of borders is not the only way to conceptualize borders. Um, and Prem Kumar Rajaram uh, asks us what would happen if we forget about the border uh, and move away from the analysis of the border as a specific place. Uh, so rather than limiting migration control to the enforcement of territorial borders, states can also be seen to construct various internal borders uh, to migrants uh, through a wider set of policies than just border control. So through their lawmaking and policies, states distinguish between legal and illegal, so-called illegal migratory movements, but they also define the rights and obligations attached to these statuses. Now, in my own work, I call this border drawing. And uh, the interesting thing here is states might not be able to keep all unauthorized migration at bay, but they can and do exercise great amounts of control over the access to public goods within their territory, including housing, healthcare, schooling and employment, for instance. And importantly, the boundaries to these different realms of inclusion might not always coincide being legal in one realm does not necessarily imply legality in all the other realms. If anything, the wide range of different permits, entry criteria and associated res residence and work rights for migrants in Europe indicate that the public policy paints many different shades of legality and semi-legality. Um, and these statuses are also highly volatile over time, space, and they're not usually organized in straightforward hierarchies of more or less inclusion. Um, and interestingly, such regimes of inclusion and exclusion don't just apply to migrants, they also apply to citizens. Uh, this is true historically as much as today, you know, think about the Roma EU citizens whose social rights are curtailed in several European countries now, including Austria, the Netherlands and Germany. These people are European citizens who exercise their free movement rights, but some of their social rights are being um, um, curtailed. Uh, historically, decolonial social theory by scholars such as Bambra and Holmwood also shows that Max Weber, who we met earlier, uh, who defined our modern concept of the state, um, also didn't think to include all of the people uh, that were already living on the Prussian territory at that, at that point in time. So his concept of uh, who is protected by the state sought to marginalize quite explicitly Polish and Jewish people living in Eastern Germany at the time. Um, so such accounts really highlight that borders cannot be conceived of as binary territorial demarcation lines. Rather, they operate to distinguish people, their rights, their statuses, also within a given territory. They are not solely concerned with granting or denying access to a territory, to a physical space, but also with regulating access to specific statuses and rights. 
Um, now, from this perspective, to span the arc back to where we started, the German government's decision in 2020 to charter flights for Romanian asparagus pickers in the middle of a pandemic um, challenges the absolutist understanding of border as physical demarcation line from the outside. These people were allowed in in the middle of a border, border closure, right? By the same token, however, the socioeconomic exclusion of formally included Roma citizens um, challenges the absolute border concept from within. So instead, I suggest that a relational understanding of borders highlights these processes as the outcomes of much more diffuse, multidimensional and often contradictory state decisions about who should have access to a given territory um, and rights and on what basis. It also highlights that such decisions are situated in specific power relations between states and specific populations and be between states and the global economy. Now to um, sum up, I want to end by highlighting three take home messages here. The first one is that concepts of borders are themselves part of a politics of producing knowledge. So how, how we understand borders and migration, of course, also informs policy making. And if we only do that in a certain way, with an absolute understanding of borders, we don't see some of the elements uh, in which um, inclusion and exclusion play out. The second is that borders or concepts of borders determine how we understand and evaluate processes of inclusion and exclusion. And thirdly, that they shape what we focus on um, and what we ignore as well when we study processes of migration and um, the relationship between migration and the state.